ice. One kilometer thick covers the land. After centuries in the deep freeze, the world emerged from the ice age and as sea levels gradually began to rise, the mighty force of moving glaciers and melting ice shaped our landscape. During this time, a land bridge connected Ireland with Scotland. It is believed that hunter-gatherers roamed across it and spread throughout the island of Ireland. They lived on the coast and along inland lakes. Their flint axes and other tools have been found along the banks of where narrow water can be seen today. Approximately 6,000 years ago, the first farmers began to work the land. These Neolithic farmers spread throughout the land, clearing the forests and planting corn. Corn was grown on raised beds, much like the lazy bed potato wigs of famine times, but they were primarily cattle farmers. Traces of their cultivation methods can be found high in the Cooley Mountains. They began to build Neolithic monuments and burial chambers for their leaders, such as Noth, Loch Crew Carnes, Newgrange, and Proleek Dolmen and Sleeve Gullion. Stones facing the Great Mound of Newgrange were brought from Templetown Beach. Their monuments were aligned with heavenly bodies. On the winter solstice, the last rays of the setting sun penetrate the burial chamber in the Carn on Steve Gullion. Around 3,000 years ago, we see the arrival of the first metal workers. The first metal workers made tools and weapons in bronze. Some examples show tremendous craftsmanship. In 500 BC, the iron workers arrived, probably bringing Celtic culture and language with them. They worshipped the sun, which made the grass grow to feed their great herds of cattle. The power of the sun was personified in their favourite fertility symbol, the mighty bull. Anton Bocunia, Ireland's Iliad. At the beginning of our era, the struggle for dominance in Ireland was symbolised by the clash of two mighty bulls, the brown bull of Cooley in Ulster and the white bull of Cruachan in Connacht. This was an all-out war and a great Connacht army led by Queen Maeve massed on the Ulster border to capture the brown bull. They crossed the Castletown River at Toblerone and camped at the mouth of the flurry near Belurgan. The weakened Ulster army were losing the battle. Their soldiers were being slaughtered. Their only chance of survival was dependent on one young hero to hold Maeve back. He was Satanta, better known as Cuchulain, who camped on Tipping's Mount. It is also known as Trumpet Hill, because every morning he sent his trumpeteer to the summit to call out a challenge for Maeve to send out a champion. Each day, they fought at the ford on the flurry, and each day, Cahullan killed a Connacht champion. The Cooley men moved the bull from glen to glen and found their best hiding place at Dove Cor, the Black Cauldron, on the Ballymacallit River. But the Connacht men penetrated the mountains and the bull was finally captured at the fort of Lithchillig in Dullargi. Cuchulain fought with the rearguard until he was finally surrounded. Wounded, he tied himself to a standing stone near Knock Bridge for his final combat.
The arrival of Christianity in the 5th century was a generally peaceful process which avoided confrontation with the old religion. The circle on the Celtic cross represents a compromise with the sun worshippers and their druids. The cross of Brigid is linked to both the Christian saint who founded a convent at Fahart and the pagan goddess of fertility with the same name. However, St. Patrick, Ireland's patron saint, is heralded as the figure that is responsible for Ireland's conversion to Christianity. Viking raiders were fierce warriors that mastered the sea. They first attacked Rathlin and Lambay Islands. They sailed across the coast and through our rivers. In the early 800s, the Vikings appeared in Cúin Aganach, as Carlingford Loch was known. In 835, they attacked Kalivi Monastery near Sleeve Gullion. In 841, they wiped out a small monastery in the ferry wood at Narrowwater. The early raiders were mostly Norwegian, the Fjön Gael or Fair Foreigners. By 900 AD, Danish Vikings, Dov Gaal, or Dark Foreigners as they were known, arrived. Although they did raid and battle, they were more inclined to settle. They built many of our first towns and cities. Their settlements can be found at Anagassen and possibly Carningford or Greenore. When Brian Boru won his victory at Clontarf in 1014, there were Vikings fighting on both sides. The Normans arrived at Bag and Bun in Wexford in 1170, led by Strongbow, Richard de Clare. With just 60 knights in armour, and 200 Welsh archers. They were skilled at war and as such easily swept the country. Nobody could stand in their way. To bring an end to their bloodshed, he then married Aoife, daughter of the King of Leinster, and Strongbow got that kingdom. The Normans began to spread through Ireland. First they built stockades on mounds, known as moats. Then they set about Ireland, building great castles. The castle at Carningford was built by Hugh de Lacey and finished around the year 1200. Local legend says that King John of Robin Hood fame stayed there briefly about 10 years later. Castle Roach was completed about 1235 under the direction of Lady Rohesia de Verdun. From the early 1300s, Carlingford was completely protected by a wall, with gates at Dundalk Street, Neary Street, Savages Hill, the Spout Gate and the Thulsal. Carlingford was a strategically important port due to its route to Armagh, 
This was a Norman English town. No Irish would have been permitted to stay within the walls at night. Strict separation was laid down in the Statute of Kilkenny in 1366. No alliance by marriage, gossiped, fostering of children, concubinage or by a man, nor in any other manner, may be henceforth made between the English and Irish. Whereas the Irish agents who come amongst the English spy out the secrets, plans and policies of the English, whereby great evils have often resulted. It is agreed and forbidden that any Irish agent, that is to say, pipers, storytellers, babblers, rhymers, moors, nor any other Irish agent shall come amongst the English. No Englishman do give or sell to any Irishman in time of peace or war, horses or armour. Every Englishman do use the English language and be named by an English name, leaving off entirely the manner of naming used by the Irish. No Englishman be governed in the determination of his dispute by Brehen law. It is ordained that the commons of the said land of Ireland do not henceforth use the plays which men call horlings with great sticks and a ball upon the ground. The Priory lay outside the walls, but tradition says there was an escape tunnel under the wall. There were numerous fortified tower houses along or within the walls. began in 1594. Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, came out in rebellion against Elizabeth I because of the English encroachment into Ulster, where he was the effective ruler. In 1596, he got Irish soldiers in the English army to hand over the castle in Carningford, but he was too slow garrisoning it, and the English took the castle again. At the Yellow Ford in 1598, he defeated a strong English army, and for a while, it seemed he had broken English power in Ireland. English forces held Dundalk, Newry and Carningford, but they could not force O'Neill out of the gap of the north. Then new English armies poured in through Dundalk and Carningford under the command of Charles Blunt, Lord Mountjoy. On one day in May 1600, there were 49 English supply ships lined out through the mouth of the lock, waiting to land food and military supplies at Carningford Quay. In November 1600, an English army provision in Newry was attacked at Bally Unan between Omeath and Carningford. But O'Neill was slowly getting surrounded by English strongholds in Newry, Carrickfergus, Derry and Strabane. By 1603, O'Neill had surrendered. In 1607, he fled to Rome, which is famed as the Flight of the Arrows. Many believe today it marked the beginning of the Plantation of Ulster. In 1641, rising by the Irish of Ulster, the Cromwellian conquest of 1649 and the subsequent Williamite Wars of the 1690s all took their toll on the local economy. As recorded in the journal of Isaac Butler, Carlingford the town was in a state of ruin by 1744. However, the final nail in the coffin was the desertion to open water of the prosperous herring shoals that occupied the lock by the early 18th century. In the 1870s, the London and North Western Railway invested heavily in Dundalk, Newry and Greenore Railway which was building lines from both Dundalk and Newry to a port which was being built in Greenore. The LNWR financed the project completely. 
This huge feat of engineering transformed Carningford completely. The railway from Dundalk to Greenore opened in 1873 and was extended to Newry in 1876. The Railway Hotel in Greenore, designed by engineer James Barton, was completed in 1875 to accommodate passengers for the Hollyhead steamer. The railway station platforms were underneath the hotel. The line finally closed on December 31st, 1951, due to the automobile becoming more common than the train. <laughs>